do you guys know what TED Talks are? Yeah? Like, I've always wanted to do a TED Talk, you know? And like, I kind of feel like I am, you know? Like, <laughs> this is a setting that looks like it would be a TED Talk. Anyway, that's just my dream. I'm sure that will never happen. But um, anyway, it's great to be here. Thank you, Carol, and thank you, Lauren. Um, I want to just start off by saying that I certainly um, don't profess to be an expert in the Valdiv. Um, and so I'm going to leave some of the translation up to you guys, but I think I've certainly read enough about it in the last year and talked to these guys enough about it that what I really wanted to do today was talk about our work um, with the pyramid model as a, as a way of thinking about how you might implement the framework here. Um, and so I think that, as Carol said, as I talk, lights are going to go off. Oh, that makes sense. Oh, that makes sense. This is how they're similar. This is where they overlap. That, those kind of things. Um, but at the end, what I'll try to do is come back to saying, um, here's what I think where, where I think we have overlap, and here's kind of lessons learned from the work that we've done. Um, so I'm going to do a little bit of an overview about why I feel like we're here, a little bit of an overview about the pyramid model, and then I'm going to talk a little bit at length about implementation issues related to the pyramid model because I think that's where there's really lessons learned um, for you guys here in Victoria around the pyramid. Okay, I gotta get used to all these screens. There's a screen right in front of me, which is really cool, but I keep wanting to turn around and look backwards like there's something different there. Um, so one of the things I always like to do is just begin by saying, why are we here? And I think that we're all here um, for the, the common commitment and focus on supporting children. I love this picture of these four little boys because it turns out that one of these kids has autism. And you look at this picture and you think these children look happy and they look like they're friends and they look like they're confident and competent learners. And that's really what we want for all children. And so, um, as you'll hear me talk today, the work that we've done around the pyramid model is really about all children. And I want to just keep emphasizing um, that even though my background is um, special education and children with disabilities, that my work really covers um, everything, all, uh, children along this, the whole spectrum. Um, the other thing I want to say is to talk just for a second about families. And so I interact with families often around children with problem behavior. And, um, and I think that families feel right away like we're blaming them for their kids' problem behavior. And so we've worked really hard as, as, as on our work on the pyramid to think about how do we build partnerships with families? How do we learn from what works at home for families that might help us in our work with children in centers? And how do we inform families about what we're doing that might help them? And so I love this quote, parents need to know that we care before they care what we know. And so in a minute, I'll be talking about building relationships with families and I think that they really don't care what we have to say until they feel like we care about them as a family. And so I think the whole relationship, um, focus on relationships is gonna be important. The other thing I wanna say is that in our work, we've, we've um, really made a commitment to this phrase I have, which is adopting a posture of support. And so, what we're about in our work is how do we support children? I mean, that's the kind of ultimate goal. Um, but we know to support children, we have to support families. And we know to support children and families, we have to support teachers or home visitors or whoever's working with children and families. And we know that in order to do that, we have to support programs. And so what I'm going to talk about today is kind of the pyramid model and how that supports children. And then the part where I talk about implementation is really going to be about how do we support people to implement the pyramid, teachers, people who work directly with children, and how do we support the programs with in which they work. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about that from a state level um, because that's one of the ways we've tried to think about this in the states. Um, so I'm not going to repeat 
to you all this slide, but I think that I wanted to just start by making sure that we are, we're all focused on the same thing. Um, and I think as you, as you heard me talk about um, our work with the pyramid, we could almost put the pyramid in the place of the framework here and it would almost say the same thing. Um, and when I look at the practice principles, which Carol talked about, I, I see the pyramid work in every one of the practice principles. And so one of the things I've tried to do today is as, as I talk about each level of the pyramid to talk about the practice principles that I see that are more closely related to that tier of the pyramid. So this is the pyramid model for those of y'all who haven't seen it. Um, and I'm gonna talk about it in detail, but I wanna just start out by saying, by giving you just a quick overview that about the pyramid model and that it's really uh, what we would consider a public health model, meaning we look at what do all children need, then we look at what do children who are at risk need, and then what do children who have more significant needs be they disabilities, problem behavior, what social emotional, um, what do we do for those children? And so I'm gonna talk through that in quite a bit of detail in a minute. Um, so why the pyramid model? So I was thinking as I was getting ready for this talk, um, Janine, who I did a talk at the university the other day, and she said, Mary Louise and her colleagues have been doing this for 15 years, and I thought, when did I get old enough that 15 years ago didn't seem that far away, right? Um, and so we have been doing this work for 15 years, and the way it all started was, um, about 15, 16 years ago probably, um, Head Start had this national conference and they brought 5,000 educators, Head Start providers together and we did these talks. So I talked to a room of 5,000 people and then at, at night they had what they considered to be intimate discussions with the experts. So the people who had presented, you know, all to the 5,000 people were available for smaller groups. Well, my group happened to be 750 people, so it wasn't exactly smaller, but I think it spoke to the concern that people have about children's um, challenging behavior and mental health needs. And so that's where the pyramid model, this, that's kind of how the pyramid model started. Um, so we were funded not long after that as a center that would look at children's, um, how to permit, how to address children's challenging behavior. And we really quickly said, you know, most challenging behavior in young children can be prevented. Most challenging behavior, we could, if we do good prevention strategies, if we do good promotion, meaning teaching social skills, promoting emotional competencies, we won't have that many young children with challenging behavior. And so we really wanted to focus not on challenging behavior, but on social emotional development. And about that time, all this work was being done on on the, how the relationship between children's social emotional development in the preschool years and how they do um, in school. And so kind of con at the same time all of this was happening, we were getting, um, studies were being done where kindergarten teachers, so for us kindergarten is the beginning of formal primary school, um, and so people were doing studies where they asked kindergarten teachers, what is it you want children to be able to do when they come to kindergarten? And it turns out it wasn't that they wanted children to be able to read or write their letters or numbers or count, but they wanted children to be able to follow directions, get along with their friends, um, manage their emotions, persist at difficult tasks. That's what they wanted um, children to be able to do. And so now we're thinking, okay, if that's what they want children to do when they come to kindergarten, we've really got to be focusing on those things um, in early childhood. And we, there was also a lot of research going on about resiliency and the idea about why do some children who come from, you know, chaotic kinds of families, what helps them be successful. And one of the things that we know helps children be successful is social emotional competence. So anyway, all of this stuff was happening at the same time. And we were tasked with thinking about children with challenging behaviors. And we said, whoa, let's stop. Let's make sure all children have the foundation. Let's make sure 
are universal practices related to promoting children's social emotional development are in place. Because we're not going to know what children need more until we make sure we're, we've got those kind of universal practices in place. And so one of the things you'll hear me talk about today, as I'm going to talk a little bit about our research, is how when we do the pyramid model work in programs, the overall quality of those programs goes up. So even though we might be there to help a specific specific set of kids, it has the effect of improving the quality of programs for all children. And I think that's a big piece of what you all want to see happening here. A little bit of data about children with challenging behaviors, and these are of course in the states, but relevant. Um, we know that about anywhere from 10 to 30 percent of preschool children have behavior that's challenging enough that it affects their interactions with peers, it affects their engagement in learning activities. We know that early appearing aggressive behaviors, so significantly aggressive behaviors, some of y'all probably have two or three or four year olds who bite and hit and ha have tantrums, right? Yes, yeah, some people are shaking their heads, right? We're not talking about that, we're talking about kids who bite and hit and kick persistently and those behaviors aren't responsive to good kind of guidance. We know that those behaviors, those early appearing aggressive behaviors are more predictive of future behavior problems than IQ is predictive of children's success academically. So those early appearing aggressive behaviors, not only do they predict how kids are going to do later, but they get worse over time. Okay, and so those are the kind of, in, those are the children that we're thinking about who need more individualized interventions, but we know that we have to have universal practices in place as well. Um, several years ago, seven or eight years ago, a, co a colleague and former student of mine did a study where he looked at the rate of expulsion in pre-K programs. So these are programs serving three, four, and five-year-olds. And what they found out was that kids in those programs were three times more likely to be expelled, that would be kicked out of their child care program because of problem behavior. I don't know if that's as disturbing to you as it is to me, but um, I one of the things I do in my um, in my Real, my job in the States is I am the director of our university lab school and you know I would never have dreamed of asking a child to leave our program and while I've been here I had a teacher say to the site director I just don't think this is the best place for him and I just gasped when I got the email like if we can't support him here where we have three adults to 12 children, and sometimes four or five adults to 12 children. If we can't support him here, where can we support him? And so I think that this is an issue that we've got to address. So I thought I would humor you a little bit with some problem behavior videos. Um, because I want to kind of show the range of problem behavior that I think that we're um, dealing with. So I'm going to just show you a few clips of behavior, and then I'll talk about them. Um, when we're doing research on challenging behavior, we do these observations where we code every 20 seconds whether a challenging behavior happened or not. And in this video, every single interval that we coded a challenging behavior would have happened. And yet, I look at this, this video and I don't think about the children's behavior. I think, what about, what about the adult's behavior, okay? So, like, like I said, I'm not sure what these children are supposed to be doing. And if I'm not sure what they're supposed to be doing, I'm quite certain they don't know what they're supposed to be doing. And so, to me, this is a universal issue. This is an issue about do we have good universal practices in place for these children in this classroom? And the answer would be no. And so we work on things like that. Now we have this little girl. You won't see her, but you'll hear her. Um, and this is a early childhood program that's a little bit more academic focused. Um, and so anyway, just listen for Gabby. No, I don't. Who else 
Chester. We are Emma. Then Benji. Dusty. Dusty. But you know what, Gabby? Maybe you can dress the bears today. You know what? Okay, it kind of goes on like that, okay? And so that to me is, an, even though I don't exactly love what the teacher's doing, she's got the children engaged, the children are responding, the children know what's expected of them, and yet Gabby's still having trouble. And so we know it's not just about universal practices, but we know there are children who, even in the context of good or decent universal practices, are still gonna have some problem behavior. And then we have these kinds of children. So now we're gonna look at Ford, and he's sitting at a table in a plaid shirt at the beginning of this. He, oh no, not a plaid shirt, a striped shirt. He's right, well, he's right there in the middle. He's pinching this little boy. Okay. All right, so that's a child who we think needs more intensive supports, okay? So I would guess that any of y'all who have had a preschool child, that child has pinched at some point, right? But when you look at the intensity of this, if we looked at the frequency of this, if we looked at you know, how long this has happened, you, you'd see that this isn't just a kind of typical two and a half year old behavior. And so as we were thinking about our work, we were thinking about all of those classrooms and children. We were thinking sometimes we need to do something for the whole classroom, sometimes we need to do something more targeted for kids like Gabby, and then sometimes we really need to do these more intensive supports for kids like Ford. Um, so, so that was kind of what led us to the, um, to the pyramid. I think the other thing, and I wanted to just throw this out there because I'm gonna talk about it later, which is that not only do we know problem behavior is an issue, but we know that people who work with children are challenged about how to support children, especially children like Gabby and um, Ford that you saw in that video. And we know we're not, in the States, we're not doing a good job of training people to do that. Um, and so when we asked, we did a survey, national survey of early childhood programs in higher education, and we asked t um, people who directed these higher ed programs, um, tell us how prepared you think your graduates are, and we listed a whole bunch of things, teaching early literacy, teaching early math, and by far the place where they said their graduates were least well prepared was in the area of social emotional development and challenging behavior. And this was true of graduate programs who were training regular early childhood people, meaning not special ed, as well as early childhood special ed programs, but it was a little wor it was a little better in the special ed programs than it was in the regular early childhood programs, but it was still an issue. Um, and so anyway, so then I've already talked about this. These are the things that kindergarten teachers want children to be able to do when they come to school. These are the things that um, are in the work on resiliency are listed. And these are the things that when children can't do them, they engage in challenging behavior, okay? So when kids can't get along with their friends or when can't, children can't persist at hard tasks or when children have a, you know, a hard to manage emotion and they, they don't know what to do with it, like they're mad and they don't know what to do with it, they engage in problem behavior. And so it all brings us back to having to promote social emotional development. So when I think about these things and what the pyramid's about, and then I look at the learning and development outcomes from your all's framework, they're really not all that much different. And as a matter of fact, we could kind of link those, these things that I've listed here with the actual learning and development outcomes that we've listed here. 
Um, Lauren, I am noticing that people are taking notes. We can, I can make this PowerPoint available. We, I, I can get it to Lauren and... It will be on our website and I'll see you be able to watch the lecture in full. Oh, well that would be scary, but <laughs> <laughs> hopefully you won't do... My mom's, one of my mom's friends emailed me and said she'd watch something I did on the internet and I said, don't you have something better to do? But anyway, it was very nice. So um, anyway, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit more specifically about the pyramid. Um, my plan is to just talk through each level really quickly because I wanna get to the implementation um, pieces. So the bottom of the pyramid, if you look at the blue level, is what we consider universal practices. So that's what all children need. Um, and we divide that level of the pyramid into nurturing and responsive relationships. Doesn't sound all that much different than your all's um, practice principle around responsive and respectful relationships. Um, and then high quality supportive environments. And so we think those two things have to be in place before you can do things more targeted or individualized. So think about Ford. Ford was the little boy who was pinching. What if you put him in that first classroom you saw where kids were rolling all over the floor, he, there would be no way you could address his behavior if the rest of the classroom was as chaotic as that first classroom was, okay? So we know that these universal practices have to be in place. When we talk about relationships at the bottom of the pyramid, we're talking about relationships between adults and children, and we're talking about relationships between teachers and families, and we're talking about relationships between um, different professionals. So Carol listed all the different people who might be working um, with young children, and what we, think, what we think is that more people working with young children should be, a, it can be a good thing when we're all working together. So in our lab school, one of the things that drives me crazy is how often um, therapists come and pull kids out of the classroom, and I just think that there's, what good does that do to pull a child out and not have the teacher or whoever works with the child every day know what you're doing? So anyway, so we work really hard on getting people to work together. When I look at this level of the pyramid, I think these are the practice principles that map on to this level of the pyramid. Although really, all of these things go across the whole pyramid, but I think these are the more direct links. Um, this is one of my favorite quotes. Every child needs one person who is crazy about him. And so, um, I don't know, I have, if I said to you all, um, think of that child that really challenges you. Can you all think about a child you've worked with in the past who maybe challenges you? Mine is this little girl named Laura who I, she was in my classroom when I student taught, like like 30 years ago and I'm still traumatized by her, you know, but one day, um, I was teaching a group time, she was probably six or seven, and I was doing large, leading a large group, and she raised her hand, and I said, yes, Laura, and she said, I'm tired of this SHIT, and I'm like, oh, oh, I know that you should ignore this behavior, so I ignored it, and then she proceeded to call me this really horrible name that I would never repeat here. Um, and then her mother tells me that she has gotten, the, the family had just bought a new white sofa. Now why you would buy a white sofa with a child like Laura, I'm not sure. And um, while her mother was, while the mother was doing something, Laura took her grape juice and wrote her name on the sofa in grape juice. So I'm thinking no one's crazy about Laura, right? And I think that that's the kind of lesson here. And so one of the things I do with the teachers in my school, one of the things I do with my practicum students, one of the things I do when I work with teachers who, have, who are working with children with challenging behaviors, is I say, what are you doing to build a relationship with that child? That child who I heard a teacher, not in my program, but in another program one day say, it's gonna be a great day, and it was because this other child wasn't coming to school. And I thought, what does that communicate to the child? Even though the child wasn't there, you think, how, how does that teacher interact with that child, and does she have a relationship with that child? And so we think that's fundamental. I think that if you have a child that you can't interact with, that you're gonna have a hard time supporting their social emotional development. 
I did some work with this program one time and I was working with them over the course of a whole school year and so I would do a training on one level of the pyramid and then I would send the, then I would be gone for a month and I would give them something that they had to do over the course of that month and so when we did the bottom of the pyramid I said sometime during the next month I want you to do something extraordinary with that child, their Laura, you know, that child who they were really struggling with. And it can't be a typical build, you know, kind of get down on the child's level kind of thing. It has to be extraordinary. And so they came back, I came back a month later and I was like, so tell me what you did. And they had done things like one teacher had ridden the bus home with the child one day with that child and just sat and talked to that child the whole way home. One had made that child her errand helper, and every time she had to run an errand in the school, had taken the child with her. And what was interesting was that nobody said they didn't like what they did. And so when they really got focused on that child outside the context of the classroom and trying to manage everything, they could really connect with that child. And so I think that my fear is that children with challenging behaviors who most, most need those relationships are least likely to access them, right? You, you know, I know about this because I've worked with these children where, you know, when they're engaging in problem behavior, you have to in, interact with them to keep them from doing it. And when they're not engaging with challenging behaviors, we say things like, I'm not gonna talk to him because I don't wanna set him off, right? Have you caught yourself saying that? And what that means is that the only time he's getting interactions is when he's engaging in problem behavior. So we really work on this relationship piece. Skip this. We also work hard on relationships with families. Um, these are some things, these are actual quotes from families that we've worked with. So I always tell the story about this dad who I went to a meeting. Um, I, the child had challenging behavior. I was there to try to help develop a plan. And this was a very well-educated dad. And he said to the teacher, so tell me how often he does this, meaning this child kicked, other, kicked children or whatever. And the teacher looked at him and said, all day long. And he said, really? <laughs> He said just all day long, he just walks around kicking people, right? And the teacher said, well, not all day long, but at least during, um, you know, free play and centers and outdoor play. And, and he said, and does he do it the whole time? And, he's, and before you knew it, the teacher said, well, he probably does it three or four times a day. And I think about the difference that if the teacher had said, you know what, we've been observing him the last couple of days and we've noticed that he's most likely to do it this time and he does it a couple of times, what that would have done for that relationship versus the, what, when, and the dad said to me, when the teacher said he does it all day long, the dad said to me later, I knew she didn't like my child then. So we work really hard on that. Um, we work really hard on how we talk to children, talk to families around children's um, behavior issues. Um, and then we work really hard on um, how we work with our colleagues around children's problem behavior. This becomes an issue, we're, we're doing some research that I'll show you about in just a minute, where we're coaching teachers, so these are pre-K teachers, and one of the biggest issues we run into is the lead teacher and the assistant teacher having really different perspectives on how you deal with behavior. One person buying into our model and one pe person thinking, if you just put him in timeout or if you just send her home or if you just ignore her, it'll go away. Um, and that's a really hard thing to do because then the child's getting those different messages. So we work really hard on helping people think about how to um, work together to support kids. The next level of the pyramid is really about environments. And so I'm sitting here thinking there's some really nice things about this environment that support this talk, that make it easy to do this talk. And that's what we want environments to be like for children. So whether they're classrooms or whether they're homes, we want children to know what to do and what's expected of them. And we want children to have routines. And that's what this level of the pyramid is all about. 
it's also, as you'll see a little bit later in the presentation, where most of our problem behavior happens. So most problem behavior in classrooms and in homes happens around routines that aren't structured. And I don't mean unstructured, meaning, uh, I don't mean structured as in rote, I mean consistent and predictable. So when things are consistent and predictable, children are less likely to have problem behavior. And so we work a lot on this um, with teachers and it's really interesting. So in our, we did this big study where we worked on the pyramid model with teachers. And when you talk about this bottom of the pyramid stuff, um, people are mostly like, I already do that, I already do that, I already do that. Yet we have data, and I'll show them to you in a minute, that says that they don't. Some do, but on average they don't. Um, and it's really hard to get them focused on it because they, they want to just jump to what do we do about Laura? What do we do about Ford? Without wanting to do the hard universal work. Well, at the end of the study, I said to the teacher, so what was the best thing you learned in this study? We'd coached them all year. And they said things like, when I got my transition structured, that made the biggest difference in the world. Or when I cut my group down, group time down from 25 minutes to 15 minutes, that made the biggest difference in the world. When you ask parents, it's all about, when, I, when we started doing the same routine at bedtime, he was, he was easier to get in bed. So these bottom of the pyramid things matter the most, and yet it's the hardest place to get people to really work on. The next level of the pyramid is about being intentional about teaching social skills and promoting emotional competencies. And I think that we sometimes think if you put children in social settings, they'll become social beings. And they can develop, some children do develop great friendship skills, learn about their emotions, but the children we're worried about don't. And I think we often are not intentional about how we teach them. So we really focus on, and when I say intentional teaching, I don't mean drill and practice rote. I, I mean, we know what we're teaching, we know how we're teaching it, and we do it with consistency, okay? Um, and the things that we work on around social skills and emotional competencies are expressing your emotions, understanding the emotions of others. We teach children about problem solving. What do you do when someone has a toy and you want it? What do you do when your friend won't let you play? Those kind of things. We work on just basic friendship skills, sharing, taking turns, trading, helping your friend. And then we work on how to manage difficult emotions. So how to manage when you're mad or sad or anxious or scared. Well, you know what? We're, we could probably all think of adults who don't do those things well, right? And so we don't think that four-year-olds or five-year-olds are gonna leave and be emotionally competent, but we get children a lot further along that spectrum when we're really intentional about teaching it. We, um, here are some of the things, these are the, the practice principles that I think are most relevant here. But when we really, I was, oh, where is it? There it is. Um, we work really hard at sharing this information with families because I think that what sometimes our first um, real interaction with families is around the child's problem behavior. And so we focus on how do we help families know how to do prevention and promotion. If we know that's what works at school, don't we think that's what might also work at home? And so we work really hard. And I think at the end of the PowerPoint, I have, um, some websites and you can go to these websites we have and you can find all sorts of handouts that you can send to families. They're all free. You can download them and use them however you want. Um, and then we know that when we do all those things I've just talked about well, we're still going to have some children who need something more intensive. And the one way we can get people focused on the bottom of the pyramid is with the promise that they're gonna have support around the top of the pyramid, okay? So knowing that someone's gonna help me with Laura or someone's gonna help me with Ford can get me invested in the bottom of the pyramid. If you go back to that study about, um, about uh, kid, child, preschool children being expelled, one of the things that they found in that study was that when teachers reported that they had access to um, behavior or mental health consultants, they were less likely to um, ha ask a child to leave. So 
access to support decreased the likelihood that they would ask children to leave their program. That's huge because in that study, it didn't say how much access they had or how much or how good that support was, but the mere fact that they had support made a difference. That's huge for thinking about how to implement these kinds of um, approaches. At the top of the pyramid, the main thing you need to know is that it's an individualized process. Um, I always think about biting, like how many of you have a preschool child who's bitten at some point or have had a preschool child who have bitten? Most of you, right? Um, so when people call me up and say, I have this child who bites, what do I do about it? My response is always, well, it depends, right? It depends on why the child's biting. So she might bite me to get me to play with her, and she might bite me to get me to leave her alone, and she might bite me because she's scared. The way that I should respond to those three things is very, very different. And if I assume that all biting's equal, and I do the same thing for all children who bite, I'm not going to be successful. So one of the things we talk about at the top of the pyramid, and I, I thought I had put this on a slide, is meeting children where they are. And this one is hard. I actually had a teacher challenge me on this just a couple of days ago. So if a child can't sit in group time, we don't make a child sit in group time. If a child can't sit for 15 minutes of instruction, we don't have a child sit for 15 minutes of instruction. We help a child begin to learn to do those things, but if, the, if we've had weeks and weeks and weeks of the child leaving group time in the middle of group time, there's nothing we're going to do between now and Monday that's going to make, make that child stay at group time. And so we're very deliberate and intentional about be, building plans for kids, but we meet them where they are. Same thing is true for um, parents. You know, I have this amazing video of this family that we did individualized behavior support planning with who were amazing. They developed their own social stories and visuals and they were fabulous. I also am super, or was supervising a student who was working with a mother who was a single mother. Her child was seven, she worked two jobs, she was pregnant with another child, and so she, her child would go to school, then he would go to his grandmother's house, and then she would pick him up at seven or 7.30 after having worked two jobs, and what did he want? He wanted attention from mom. What did she want? To get him fe fed, bathed, and in bed, right? Because she was exhausted. So if I had said to her, we're gonna do this whole big plan like I did with that other family, it would have never worked. So we started with her where we said, for the first 15 minutes when you walk in the door, do whatever your son wants. So if he wants to watch TV with you, if he wants to play puzzles with you, if he wants, do what he wants. So that was this, the beginning step. And that's about meeting families where they are. It's about meeting children where they are. Um, so anyway, at the top of the pyramid, we do these really individualized plans for children um, that are team-based. We often have speech, mental health, teachers, families, administrators, sometimes because of the need for extra support, um, involved in the development of this plan. So the big point around the pyramid is meeting all children's needs. And it turns out, it's really kind of cool, that when we coach teachers on this, that as we get to the top of the pyramid and we develop plans for children at the top, they realize that some of those things we do for that child help all children. And it's a really evolving, cool process. Okay, one thing I want to talk about, or one thing I want to do just to break this up a little bit, is talk a little bit about transitions, because I know that's big in the framework. Um, so one of the big problems with the work that we do around with in, so if you have a pyramid model classroom, children look very successful when people are doing the pyramid model really well because it's designed to help children be really successful. So we have these great, these kids looking really, really successful and then they go to kindergarten and suddenly they're not successful at all. And so people say, he's reverted back, blah, 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 whatever, when in fact the supports that he needs were there in preschool and they're not there in kindergarten. And that's why he looks in less competent, okay? So we work really hard at thinking about how do we send 
children's support with them, not meaning people or whatever, but how do we send information to the next teacher who's going to have this child about what supports he needs to be successful. So we do, we do some work around that. Um, one of the projects um, that I work on, um, I hope I have this queued up. On one of the projects I work on, um, we have been work doing quite a bit of work on transitions. And so one of the things we did, um, and one of the things I was reading about in the framework documents that I was reading was about asking children what's important to them and ha having children be kind of active in that role. So I thought I would show you this video that we did for a project where we asked children to talk about transitions. Okay, so these are children who transitioned from kinder pre preschool to kindergarten first grade. The ones he and 
snake. On the popcorn with We go on field trips, but not to big. See those pumpkins over there? That one with the pretty stamp is mine. We went to the pumpkin patch. We learned all about pumpkins. That's a picture of it. My favorite thing in kindergarten is lunch. Lunch room? You need to eat the best home. eating. In preschool, you they get to pick where you got set. And in regular school, I got to buy my lips and pick where I sit. So it can be next to a friend. What do you play with in school? Um, I get to the outside of the toys. I miss school. At preschool, like, you got to like really play and you didn't like have to do anything. And at kindergarten, you kind of have to like learn that alphabet and like learn how to write and stuff. I like to play with my friends. I like to play inside a classroom. I wish we could play more in kindergarten. Kindergarten's fun! Kindergarten rock. Go ba, go ba. Whoa, we gotta go. Yeah, 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 yeah. Go ba, go ba. Whoa, we gotta go. Okay, that was a little humor for you there. So that video, um, as is the case with most of what we do, is online and you can use that if you want to free. All right, so that was just a little fun. Um, it, but I think one of the things I was thinking about when I was thinking about that video was how competent those kids look, but I also know where those children came from and I know where they're going and it happened to be in the same school, in a school that was very focused on the pyramid model. And so you kind of get that from listening to these children. Okay, so we talked about supporting children, we talked about supporting families, and now I want to talk about supporting the people who are going to implement the practices in the pyramid, because this is where the rubber hits the road, as we would say. This is where it really matters. So what we know, and you can read this, is that, I'll show you some data in a minute, that teachers don't do a lot of these practices consistently, and that teachers don't feel supported in learning to do these practices. So we, I had a meeting with all of our teachers who were in our study and I couldn't, I was asking them what they liked and didn't like about coaching. And one of the teachers said to me, I said, I finally, I, they wouldn't say anything negative. So I finally said there had to be something negative. No, 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 maybe time. And I said, what was so good about coaching? And they, this teacher said, I've just never had anyone like that. And I said, tell me what that means. And basically what she said was, I've never had anyone who came into my classroom on a regular basis just to help me do something better, not to evaluate me. There's a whole bunch of stuff in that in, that I can't, that I don't have time to talk about tonight, but that idea that teachers or people working with children and families have access to support that is not evaluative that is only supportive, that's a huge implementation issue. I know it is for us, like how do you have an administrator whose job is to evaluate your performance who and someone to do coaching? How do you separate those two roles? And yet I think we know that you have to. And these are, of course, some of the practice principles that relate to what I'm talking about now. So I wanna talk a little bit about how we've supported teachers. So. Um, I'm showing you a tool that we developed. So we developed a tool called the Teapot, which is the Teaching Pyramid Observation Tool. And it's a way to measure whether people are implementing the pyramid practices with fidelity. I think there's flyers out there about it, and I'm on, I'm, I don't wanna come across as wanting to sell something. That's kinda not my style. But it is a very cool tool in terms of being able to coach teachers. We use it a lot as a way of making decisions about what we need to do professional development on, and we use it to determine whether our professional development is effective. And I'll show you an example of how we did it. So these are the data that I've been talking about. 
All you need to know about this graph is those red numbers. So these are, you know, 130 or 125 classrooms that we've been in in a range of different studies that we've done. These represent child care classrooms, which is basically daycare kinds of classrooms, public school, pre-kindergarten programs, and Head Start programs. So the whole range of early childhood programs. And what you can see from those numbers in red is that before we coach people to use the pyramid model practices, on average, people are doing about 40% of those practices. Now, when I talked about the pyramid model, there was nothing magic in it, right? A lot of what I talked about are things that teachers should be doing if they're doing good developmentally appropriate practice. And yet, what we see is on average, they're doing about 40% of those practices. What's a little more disturbing is the range. So from 14% of those practices up to about 75% is what we see when people haven't been trained. So as we started thinking about how are we gonna support teachers, we did a review of the literature. And essentially what I can tell you that's, that you really need to know that's really relevant here is that the important thing is that when studies, when professional de development is effective, it involves some kind of coaching or what we call performance feedback, meaning it's some type of support that you give to people in the practice setting so that you're in the classroom giving feedback or you're in the home if they're doing home visiting giving feedback. That's, that's the really only professional development strategy that we have really good research to support as being effective. And by what, what we mean by being effective is that it changes people's practice, okay? Um, so there's professional development that is effective at teaching, at improve, um, increasing people's knowledge or increasing people's awareness. Those you don't need to do coaching, but if you want change in the practice setting, you have to do coaching. It's also the case, I don't know, a couple of years ago, our Department of Ed, our, our National Department of Ed, did a review on coaching research and basically said coaching doesn't work. When you look at studies on coaching, if you can determine from the study what the coaching was, how it was done, how often, whether it was done well, it works. If you can't tell that, it doesn't work. In other words, if we're not doing coaching with some level of fidelity, we're not gonna get change. And I'll kind of show you a little bit about how this has played out in our work. So we have a coaching model that we call practice-based coaching, which is what you really need to know that's important about it is that it's coaching around an identified set of practices. It's about me knowing what I'm coaching you on, and it's about you knowing what you're being coached on. So when I'm coming out, we know exactly what we're working on. Those practices are well articulated. And this goes back to the pyramid model, where, or the teapot, where the teapot articulates what the practices are that we expect people to do, and the teapot's what we measure people's progress on related to coaching. You don't need to know anything about these slides other than to say that the amount of coaching we do is pretty intense. So in the data that I'm gonna show you, on average, teachers got 13 weeks of coaching. Now let me tell you what that means. That means that someone observed in their classroom, somebody met with them, and somebody gave them a long email feedback that summarized, email that summarized all the feedback. So on average, a, a coach spent about five hours a week coaching the teacher, and the teacher got that for approximately 13 weeks. So it's not one, two, or three coaching visits. It's a lot of coaching. What you need to know about this, and you don't really need to pay attention to the numbers other than we know that the coaching was done with fidelity. So we have a checklist of the components of coaching that we expected our coaches to do, and we audio tape them and score whether they're coaching with fidelity. So we know that for children to change, we gotta do the pyramid with fidelity, and we know for teachers to change, we gotta do coaching with fidelity. So these are the data from our first study. We're in the middle of our second study, towards the end of our second study right now. 
So in this graph, the red line are teachers who didn't get coaching, and the blue line are teachers that did, and this is over the course of a school year. So teachers who don't get coaching on the pyramid stay about the same. Teachers who do get much, much better. This is what happens to children with problem behavior in those teachers' classrooms, and these are social skills. So the social skills of teachers who get the social skills of children with problem behavior whose teachers get coached get better, and the social skills of problem of children who have problem behavior, their social skills actually get a little bit worse, which makes sense. So if I have a problem behavior and you don't know how to deal with it, I'm going to increase my problem behavior, which has a direct effect at on my appropriate social behaviors. That's pretty important. The other thing, this is just one piece of data. All of our data that we have on children around social skills and problem behavior, it clear, shows a clear effect of teachers getting coaching. Now you're going, what the world is this? So basically what this is, what this says is it's not only that if you get coaching, your kids get better, but it's the it's not just whether you do the pyramid model practice as well that your kids get better, but the better you do the pyramid model practices, the better your children get. So that idea about only doing 40% of the practices, if you get up around 65 or 70%, we start to see an effect on children, but you get up around 80 and the effect is amazing, okay? So the better teachers get, the better children get. And the only way teachers seem to get better is if we do a pretty high dose of coaching. And there's all sorts of input, like you're sitting there going, how are we gonna get teachers that level of coaching, right? But, and I wanna talk about how I think you can do that. So. Essentially, I've summarized all that. Now, what I want, so now I'm sitting here thinking Carol's going right, like we're ever going to be able to provide everybody with that level of coaching. So one of the things we t we've been thinking about is how, so that coaching that we did was one teacher in an elementary school. We were coaching that one teacher, nobody else, because it was part of our research design. What if you coached every teacher in the same school? and you had an administrator who was on board and everybody was doing the same thing and if you were having trouble you could go to the teacher next door and ask for help maybe they wouldn't need the same dose of coaching so we've been thinking about how can we support whole programs so that everybody in the program is working on it at the same time and we have that level of support going to everybody, then maybe the coaching that we have to do for an individual teacher can be less intense. Are y'all following me? So um, our teachers in our study are in elementary schools and one of the teachers believed that her administrator said she had to do two hours of worksheets around literacy every day with four-year-olds. So we're coaching her to do something very different with that and we're bumping up against her perception that her administrator thinks she should be doing something different. We think that we ought to start with the administrators. We ought to get them trained and skilled and then, yeah, then begin to support teachers. And so what we've done this is um, what we've done is we've thought about how do we implement the pyramid program wide, whether that's a center, child care center, or maybe a whole school system where everybody's working on the pyramid at the same time. And so let me just give you an example of how that might work. So you might do that, and all the things around the pyramid here are things that you have to do to do the pyramid program wide. But let's think about what that means for professional development. So we have 10 teachers in this building, and we want to train them all to do the pyramid. So we do um, a big introductory training of the pyramid, and then we do teapots in everybody's classroom. And from the teapot data, we find out that every teacher in the building is having trouble with transitions. So maybe we do a group training for those teachers, we do some individualized help in th having them think about their classrooms, and they're getting better because they're all working on it. And then we find that this one teacher over here is really struggling with large group and her teapot scores are just more, are lower kind of across the board. And so maybe we decide she needs extra support. So do you get what I'm getting at? So all of a sudden we don't have to give every teacher 
13 coaching visits, but maybe some teachers need it and maybe some teachers don't. We don't have enough data on our teachers in our first study to be able to say this, but it looks to us like teachers who are doing pretty good need some coaching to get up above the threshold, um, but not a lot. But those teachers who are in that 40% and below range, we don't even think the coaching we did was adequate, okay? But I do think that we can almost think about a pyramid model for teachers, which is what training do all teachers need? Could we do some more targeted training? So we're doing this project right now where we're training, we're coaching groups of teachers. So a coach might have five teachers and they're all working on the same thing and they all develop action plans around transitions. They observe each other and the coach gets to each classroom once a month not every week, okay? There's ways to think about this that might get the same dose, but more individualized and targeted for individual teachers. So when we do the pyramid, program, pyramid model program-wide, these are the kind of outcomes we get. And this is what I was referring to early in my talk when I said something about we get overall improvements in program improvements in overall program quality. We see that time and time again. We see teachers do more intentional teaching. We see better partnerships with families. The really cool thing is that every time we work with a program program-wide, we see this amazing increase in um, teacher satisfaction. And that's big when we're talking about challenging behavior because teachers aren't very satisfied when they have children with, with um, challenging behaviors in their classrooms. This, these are just some data that look at, we do this measure about behavior incidences um, program-wide. And that red line is the decrease in behavior incidences over the year for the first year that this program was doing program-wide implementation. And the purple is what the behavior incidences look like in year two. We never are gonna get behavior incidences down to zero. We don't even expect that. But look at the decrease over the course of two years. So, so now we know how to do it in programs, right? So now we gotta figure out, Carol's gotta figure out, Lauren's gotta figure out, how do we make, how do we provide supports to programs to be able to do this? And so the way that we thought about doing this was we've worked with states. And so what we've done within states, and actually Lauren's gonna come to the US next month and talk with some of our states about how we've done this. So we've essentially put together um, teams, leadership teams within states that cover all the sectors that work with young children. And we've basically designed a professional development approach that is statewide. So we've trained, um, we're gonna do this a little bit um, in a couple of weeks while I'm here. We've trained people to be trainers. So states have their own trainers around the pyramid model. We've trained states to provide training on how to be a good coach. We've trained people within states to be good database decision makers. So what we've done is we've gone in and provided a lot of support to states for about a year but what we've done is built their capacity to be able to support local programs to implement the pyramid model. And so you can see some numbers, those red numbers, about the effects that we've had or the kind of work we've done. But what's more important is how states are moving towards sustaining this initiative without us. So Lauren's gonna go to um, Colorado. And Colorado's a perfect, they were a state that we worked with at the very beginning. And by the end of their, the year we worked with them, they, they had had multiple um, agencies within the state come up with half a million dollars to support that initiative long after we left. And that was probably seven or eight years ago, and they're still, that initiative's still there. It's still state funded. Um, they've, they've developed a whole process for training coaches and credentialing coaches all because we worked with them for a year to, to, to build their capacity to be able to do that. What I have on these slides 
is just some what we call ripple effects. So these weren't things that we set out to do, but when we worked with states, these are some things that happened. So one of the things that happened was when we worked with states, they were going, why are people not prepared? Our pre-K teachers all have teacher certification and they're not prepared to deal with kids with challenging behaviors. And so we've seen states embed pyramid model content into their certification requirements, into their license, licensing for programs. It's kind of infiltrated their systems. We've also seen people embed pyramid model work into other initiatives. So I can just give you, I've mentioned a couple of these, but one of the things that has just happened in the US in the last couple of years is the president has funded these huge race to the top grants for um, states, like I think 50, 60 million dollars a year to do to build community-wide systems of support for young children. And probably half of our states that we've worked with who got raised to the top grants have actually have a huge part of their race to the top grant is around the pyramid model. So we're seeing these effects that weren't what we intended, but when you really work on this at the state level, you get these kind of effects. So I wanted to play this video. This is um, the state child care director in the state of Colorado, and she was kind of the, one of our biggest cheerleaders. She was like, the pyramid model is where it's all about. And she was really responsible for pulling together the team of people who um, funded the initiative, who continue to fund the initiative in the state. So this is her talking a little bit about why she did it. Time in a child's academic career. In Colorado, I'm part of the Office for Children and Families. The Division of Youth Corrections is one of the divisions in my office. Their funding is 10 times my funding. Yet I know that if I can give them a list of three-year-olds who without intervention, whose teachers will not have these skills, that they will see in youth corrections in 10 years. Why not invest now? I would encourage states to take the time to invest right now, change children's lives right now, give the best and the brightest teachers that we have who want to work with these children the opportunity to be successful by investing in the pyramid model training so that they can go in and prevent these behaviors that we're seeing prevent them before we ever see them which will then give the children a great chance of success so i think that's pretty power powerful and that's why she's found the money to do what she's done because she so believes in the in the possibilities of what it could mean so let's kind of return to the framework here kind of in summary and then we can have questions so one of the things i thought about was and lauren and carol and i have certainly talked about which is how does the pyramid model support the framework and so what i've got here are just some of the examples of how um, i think the pyramid model supports the framework i was reading a document that um, janine had given me about the framework last night and I was like wishing I could highlight it, but it was her copy, so I was sure she probably wouldn't like that, because I wanted to highlight every place I read something about the framework that I knew we were doing in the pyramid, and it was pretty staggering. So even though the pyramid is focused on social emotional well-being and competence of young children, it turns out that so much about the universal practices of the pyramid are what have to be in place in, in classrooms to do good math teaching and to do good you know, instruction on literacy, having children engaged, having relationships with children, having predictable routines. That all sets you up for being able to teach anything, not just social skills and emotional competency. So I think there's that overlap. What have we learned from our work with the pyramid model that I think informs implementation? And I think the things that I would say are that we have focused, and we didn't do it to begin with. We started out developing a model for how to address kids' needs. And as we went around doing training on the pyramid, people were saying, this is great, but it'll never work in my program. And so then we said, okay, what do we have to do so it'll work in people's programs, right? We can't just train these teachers, have them be very excited about it, and then they get out to their programs 
and their enthusiasm is somehow extinguished by policies that don't support it. Um, so we so. And then we said, but if programs are going to do this, it's not like programs know how to do this. How are we going to support programs? And so we realized really quickly that to make this work, it wasn't about just training teachers, or wasn't just about training home visitors, or it wasn't just about working with families, but it was about building programs support and competence and building our, own, our state supports and competence around this. You know, at the the bottom line about any of this is about professional development. And people ask me all the time, how can we do it cheaper? And the answer is, I don't know. I mean, I know some ways. I think the program-wide work we were talking about offers a way to do it maybe cheaper. I think, um, I don't mean cheaper, that, but requires fewer resources. Um, my colleagues at the University of Virginia have done work around how do we do this same kind of coaching but do it via Skype or via the internet or via video. That cuts down on cost. There's no travel. You can, one person can coach more people. You know, my coaches have to see the teacher during the part of the day when most instruction goes on and that's in the morning and that means they can only see five teachers a week. So. If you're doing it by video and people are um, making video and sending them in, one person could probably coach more people in a week. But can you coach everything about the pyramid based on short video clips? I don't think so, but you can probably do some of it. So I think there's ways to think about you know, this idea about group coaching, this idea about small group coaching, about peer coaching. I think there's ways to think about it being a little less resource intensive, but I absolutely know that if we can't figure out how to deliver good professional development, we're not going to have the pyramid model in place and y'all aren't going to have the practices associated with the framework and practice. Um, I think this state systems work I have to tell you, I am not a state systems person, and thank goodness you're going to go see Barbara Smith, who is a state systems person. But from the very beginning, I'm about, how do we get teachers to do the pyramid? And Barbara's like, we got to build state systems. I'm like, we got to figure out how to get teachers to do this. She's like, we got to build state systems. And it turns out you do have to build state systems, and you do have to figure out how to deliver supports. Um, and the kind of supports, and I, I don't know this exactly for you all, but the kind of supports and the way you get support to child care is really different than the kinds of systems and support you get to Head Start, which is different than the systems of support that you get to public school pre-K. And the race to the top grants that um, Obama's done in the states are an effort to say it shouldn't be different. We should have a collective early childhood system within states that supports children and professionals no matter what kind of system they're in. Barbara might have better ideas about how to make that happen than I do, but I'm absolutely certain that we have to do it. Anyway, this is my favorite quote to just end on. And do you want me to just take questions or? Right on time. Right on. I know. She told me 7.30. It's 7.29. I did skip some videos in order to get that done. <laughs> I'm looking for a red light. Yay! And someone else can push yours to see the green light come on and we'll get to it. Okay. Um, I've got lots of questions, but the one that I, um, which is always a curiosity, are you following these children? Because when you projected what kids with social emotional difficulties had, they would end up in um, another system that we mm -hmm. don't want. Mm -hmm. So, are you following the couple? So her question is, are we following children? And the answer is not yet. Um, the way that we are federally funded in our research and the way it's funded is you got to have multiple trials of it working before you can move into does it help longitudinally. The question we are, we're asking that is not more important but probably equally as important that we are tracking a little bit is whether teachers that we coach continue to do this when we're not coaching. That's a really important question in terms of sustainability and, you know, kind of long-term um, support. 
you know, your question is a good one, and um, I have to keep myself from being a little bit sarcastic about responding to it because I'm so um, puzzled by thinking we can do anything for a year that's going to matter if we put them in bad elementary schools. You know, and I don't mean that, I don't mean every elementary school's bad, but geez, I don't know. But, you know, people with, people who really know this stuff would argue that if you're really helping children communicate their emotions well, if you're helping kids regulate well, that then if they go into a setting that isn't as supportive, that they've, that those are, those are processes that should serve them well. So one of the things we teach children to do is about social pro problem solving. And so if someone has a toy you want, what can you do? And you know, you can ask for it, you can share, you can trade, you can, and one thing we always teach them is you can get an adult because we figure if nothing else works, it's better for them to go get an adult than it is for them to engage in problem behavior to get whatever they want. Well, you know what? Being able to do that and going to kindergarten is probably really helpful. So we not only teach them, I can do this or I can do that or I can do this, but if this doesn't work, I can try this. And if that doesn't work, I can get a teacher. That probably does serve them well, um, but I'm not, absolutely certain that we do it with enough intensity in preschool to have that effect. But it, it's, it's an empirical question. Kindergarten teachers who get our children think that they, it's made a difference, but we don't have data on that yet. Anyone else? Oh, there's a red light. Hi. Hi. Well, um, I'm sorry to say we don't yet know the answer to that question. So we just finished our first year of, well, we're about to collect our last data point of our first year of sustainability, teachers in sustainability year. Um, anecdotally, um, our data collectors, our data collectors are blind to whether teachers got coached or not, but if they, figure out that a teacher was in the intervention group, they have to let us know, it's just part of our design. They almost always can pick out the teachers that were coached, and that's in the kindergarten year. Now, having said that, the one bad news story is that we, we so we did this first study about five years ago, and about a month into the fall, we were had this teacher in our study, and all of a sudden, she said to her coach, well, I, I learned about this a while ago. And she had been in our first study and hadn't remembered. So um, I'm not completely optimistic, but I'm pretty optimistic that it changes some things. We, I think that, y'all aren't gonna like this, I really think that to do the pyramid well, you probably need two years of coaching. And if you think about, that the pyramid model is about everything that teachers do in the classroom. It's about their schedules and their routines and their interactions and how they teach and how they assess and stuff like that. Maybe we can't do it in a year. I don't know. The other piece of this that you should know is that the teachers who were in our study are teachers who are certified. And a lot of our teachers um, in the States in child care and Head Start aren't certified teachers and we don't even begin to know what it's going to take with different sets of teachers. Wait, there's one more question. Do you want to, oh, go ahead. Okay. Oh, 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 sorry. Your light, your red light is not on and her red light is or his or someone's up there. Just a question to get a bit of an idea of using the road. Yay, I'm glad y'all are here. Oh, wow. PSFOs or ISFs? And bureaucrats? <laughs> we like y'all too. And any maternal and child health? Or local government? Community help? So, kind of mix here. I think I've covered everyone. 
Um, because I think what's interesting is we've got a lot of early childhood intervention people in it and we're the big body for early childhood intervention. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I feel like when we have these conversations, we're preaching to the choir a lot of the time. I think inclusion is kind of at the core of what we do. So I suppose why we're interested in, in having these conversations is how can our early childhood intervention workers not only improve their practice with families in the home and how they're doing in home visiting and, and key worker as we talked about here, but also how can they be empowering their colleagues that are working in those universal settings? So I suppose, how have you seen that unfold in your work in the States, in that relationship between early intervention and early childhood education and care? Because for us, the framework is actually about bringing us all together and having that common way of work. Yeah, and what I would say is it's not their responsibility to do that. It's not the home visitors and the teachers' responsibility to do that. It's your all's response. It's the bureaucrats. It's about how we plan professional development. I mean, the issue that I, the, the you know, kind of parallel that I can think about in the states that we struggle with all the time is that we have early childhood educators, early childhood special ed, so whatever, on board about it, but then we have physical therapists and occupational therapists and speech therapists who want to pull kids out and who, and I don't think that one PT who wants to be in the classroom is going to, is the way to change it. I think we've got to get that training into their training programs. We got to get them to our trainings. You know what I mean? I think too often we put too much of this on the backs of you guys, of the people who are the early interventionists and the early childhood educators when really it's not, it shouldn't be on their backs. It should be on ours to create systems where everybody gets that training. The other thing that I see happen a lot is I train my students to do things and they go into systems that don't support it and they just revert back to things I don't think they should do because the system, they want, it's just so hard for one person to fight that system. So I think it's a systems problem and not so much a, a practitioner's problem. Yeah, Carol. Oh, is there a red, there's a red light. Oh, sorry, there it is, I saw it and then it went away. <laughs> That's a really good question, and one I'm going to talk about more on Saturday if you're around. But um, so, in the study that I just talked about, those coaches were all what I consider to be homegrown coaches, meaning they knew they worked with us for years. They helped us develop the coaching model, and so that's a really different one. For the study we're doing now, because it was bigger, we had to hire coaches, and we went with. Um, that we were more concerned that the coach have credibility with the teachers than we were that they had coaching experience. Meaning that if they were gonna coach teachers in classrooms, they needed to have been teachers in classrooms or they needed to have had experience in classrooms. Um, and we chose that over people who had been coaches. Um, in the States, we find a lot of people who call themselves coaches being people who come from a mental health background. And the kind of coaching we do is really about implementing effective practices. And if you don't know them and you can't do them, we can't teach you to do that. But I think we've developed a really good process for training people who do know that how to be good coaches. So that would be the bottom line is that they, you know, part of our coaching model is if the teacher says, I don't understand what that looks like, you can model it for them. So um, so our, we have definitely gone with people who have experience and then trained them to be coaches. And I don't have any evidence to suggest the other way around would be a better way to go. So. Carol, Do I push it? I'm, it seems like the green light ought to be oh, the go one versus, it's, it's very confusing. Okay. Uh, I think we have some good things in place here in that we have a national quality framework mm -hmm. that um, what we have in the national quality framework for all early childhood education and care settings and what we have in the Belgium 
is that it's what we're trying to articulate is inclusion is everybody's business. Mm -hmm. And that the core to inclusion is a high quality program. Mm -hmm. So it's a similar sort of message that you're saying. We also, I think, have an opportunity to think about how our um, kindergarten inclusion support might look in the future. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the, the focus of that support case, right. is um, capacity building mm -hmm. and they have, um, we have a highly skilled workforce there that is, um, um, I suppose, early childhood educator with sometimes special ed qualifications as well, um, so they understand the context. Mm -hmm. So I think there's an opportunity for us to think. I think there's also an opportunity to think about perhaps, and this is something for everybody to consider, where do um, the pedagogical leaders in our early childhood <laughs> education and care sit now and what is their role in here? And also we have kindergarten cluster managers and where mm -hmm. do they sit mm -hmm. in their role of, um, I suppose, supporting professional development? And I do agree with you that I think Professional development is not stand up and deliver. It's that's an information mm -hmm. session, mm -hmm. and that really um, to have an impact on acquisition of skills and um, embedding that in their everyday practice, it needs to be more of that one to one. So there's challenges for us as a department, but there's opportunities for us, I think, to have further discussions on where we might go mm. into the future with this work. Yes, yeah, so let me say two things about that. One is, um, when I was here before, and Lauren, you might have to help me, and we're going to do this again tomorrow, I think. Um, we did an activity where we had people who were here for a training think about their role in implementing the Valtive. And it was a very interesting activity. People were really engaged in it and really thoughtful about it but some people were really <laughs> struggling to see what their role is. And I couldn't tell you who those people were because I don't know. But, but I think that might be one issue is do, do people see that they have a role in it and how do we help them see what their role is? Um, and kind of connected to that, one of the things we've been doing both on our pyramid work as well as on the project where the transition video came from is we've been doing, when you said PD, it made me think, we've been doing these things called leadership academies where we bring together a team from a program. So it'll be a service provider, a um, administrator, someone who's involved in professional development, could be a parent, could be an assistant teacher. And we spend three days figuring out how to build program supports for whatever it is we're doing. And we have yet to get an evaluation from one of those trainings that isn't great. Um, people really value that. And it's, we, we, we conduct them where we do, we talk for 30 minutes and then they have what we consider a team meeting um, where they apply what we've talked about work, figure out what they're gonna do in their program, keep notes. And then the last half of a day is a whole um, planning process. So they walk around with what they walk away with what they have to do in one month from now, what they have to do six months from now, and what they have to do a year from now. Remind me to give you a set of those materials when you're in the state. Because we've now done that in a couple of different projects, and that's something that I think holds some promise. So. Yeah. I did um, attend a, a forum today and I think one of the issues we have in our early childhood sector is probably everyone feels time for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, how do we get that balance of if we really want the best outcomes for children, isn't it worth spending that bit of time mm -hmm. on getting that high quality program in place? because the outcomes are just unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. We have a hard time getting people to commit to three days because of what it means in terms of, yeah. um, but people walk away thinking it was the best thing they ever did. So we I get, champions, I yeah, yeah, champions, yeah. yeah, for sure. All right. I will get you to press your button off, and then the next person will go red, which is Bren. Bren. Oh, and there's Bren. a, Bren. 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 yes, go ahead. 
That's okay. I was wondering where you're up to in your project of influencing the animal health professionals through the classroom. Well, in our research, we're not really doing that in our own program. Isn't that just the worst when your own program isn't, you know, like right in your backyard, they're not doing. Um, so that has uh, in the States, and I assume true is true here, a whole different set of issues, which is about billable hours. And so OTs and PTs and speech people bill by the hour or their, so we have therapists who serve our children, are contracted by the public schools, but serve the children the children are placed in our program and so they have to see they have to see her an hour a week and so there some of them have a hard time conceptualizing that being in the classroom helping her engage in classroom activities using her language whatever if they're the speech therapist should count for that hour so they only see that if they pull them out so we're doing work on that kind of what's working better so we have those therapists, but what's working better is we have these consulting therapists that we pay for, so they're not, they're not paid to work with a specific child. They're there for 20 hours a week to support any teacher or any kid. Those therapists we're getting in the classroom because they, they can be part of the planning and they can be part of, um, they, they don't have to bill by the kid and that kind of thing. So. I wouldn't say we're doing well, but we're doing better. But it's hard. It's, it's just a complete philosophical shift for some of those people to go from, I pull this kid out and do an hour of speech with them, to I help them use their language in the classroom. And that's really interesting for us as we think about moving towards the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Part of that is going to be based on billable time. Mm -hmm. And you don't get paid unless you deliver the service. So I think that's a big challenge for all of us in early childhood intervention and also for classroom teachers about how we work together to get the best outcomes rather than delivering units of therapy. Yeah, and then if you want them to be involved in planning, where does that hour a billable? You know, it's and that's just one more time that I think our systems are just not set up and to do this comes well. Back, I think, to how we explain to Mm -hmm. what we're doing. Yeah, yeah. And how early childhood intervention professionals, I'm sure many in this room, would have been working with families and working in universal settings and doing home visiting and working with kindergarten teachers. And then 18 months, two years later, the family says, well, when's my therapy going to start? Mm -hmm. Because we haven't done a very good job at explaining what it is that we're doing yeah. and the importance of natural environments and routines and things like that. So I think that's our big challenge as well. If we could explain it, then they'd get that that's actually a unit of therapy. Yeah, and they just think it's not as intense, and that's a hard thing to explain. The, I was just having this flashback to, um, we have a little boy in our school who has no arms and legs, and he has a wheelchair, but he also, one of the ways he gets around is to roll, you know, roll himself wherever. So one day I was walked downstairs, and there was the PT, walking down the hall and he was rolling down the hall and I said to myself really really couldn't he have rolled down the hall with his friends you know what I mean to go somewhere did the PT really have to pull him out to do this and I didn't say anything because of course the way I would say it would not have come across well and it wasn't very much longer after that that I was down there and I spotted three kids and they were all rolling down the hall with him and I loved it. I thought, isn't that what it's all about, you know? And, but it's, God, it's really a hard philosophical change. Okay, red light. Hi, um, I'm an English book facilitator. Uh-huh. I work directly with educators. Um, and when you were talking about partnerships, mm -hmm. um, I think it's really important to think about how we can work Mm -hmm. So then when we're working with them, we need to bring everyone together, you know, and have inclusive support meetings where we all come together and are able to work to build the capacity of that educator to take that knowledge and actually put it into practice in, in their mm -hmm.
do go out to service and then we are signed parent permission forms, we'll often talk to the staff and say, you know, if they've got ill intervention, get them on the, the, uh, the listing so that we can talk to them as well. Which then just opens up conversations. You know, I've had conversations with early intervention staff who are having issues with educators so that we can talk together, mm -hmm. think about it, deal with it in different ways and just try different approaches. And it's been really, really successful. So I think the partnership thing is really important. Yeah, and that thing you said about we have an early on staff, you're on staff in the same place together, is yeah, that what you mean? Yeah, the organisation I work for has yeah. these yeah. um, uh, um, uh, staff, mm -hmm. as well as staff. Yeah. So the kind of parallel to that, I think, um, I've worked with programs where they have related services staff on that are full-time, you know, like an OT that's full-time in that program. The extent to which that OT does integrated stuff is so much better because she's her time's all about that program and it's not about billable hours and she's part of that program and knows the philosophy and you know so I think if we just create systems where people are working together and they have a co common expectations that that makes a lot of difference whereas a lot of times it's this person's coming into work and they're administrative expectations are one thing and this person coming in with different ones and what you're describing everyone's kind of there with the same expectations. Really have the program in place. So yeah. If you're not, you know, if you're standalone they need to be aware that they can then, you know, if they're having some issues with educators or think that they can build capacity with contact us mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. agency because the, the system's already there. Yeah. And yeah. Have to reinvent the wheel. yeah. Yeah. Yep, yep. Good. That's exciting. It's not just a common language, it's actually about our own practice as well. And if we're all engaging in similar practices, then it's more than just saying the same words, it's actually we have the same way of doing as well. And I think that's what's so important too. Often we look at frameworks and just think of it as being that language. Yeah. And really it's actually about practice and how we change mm -hmm. our practice together to collaborate. And I think that's what is so important for us as we move towards the greater implementation of our frameworks and using the strategies that the pyramid gives us mm -hmm. is how can we actually change our practice together and collaborate together rather than just say the same words but be totally different. So. Yeah. You know, um, one thing the pyramid's done is gotten people to use the same language and to be on the same page about things. And I have this one director that you might be able to meet in Florida. She, it would be good for you to meet her, who um, she says, when I hire new people, they, if they don't believe in this and aren't willing to come along with this, then this isn't the place for them to work. And so I think that's one thing to think about is as we're hiring people and bringing new people into the field, that we bring them in with that being the expectation and with the framework being what we do. And if you can't, if you're not, if you're not up to it or you don't agree with it, then there's probably a better place for you to work. And I don't even mean that negatively. I mean, you know, I think there are self-contained programs in Nashville public schools that if someone doesn't believe in inclusion, we need good teachers in those classrooms, even though I don't think we should have those classrooms. But if we're going to have them, we ought to have good teachers there, right? Um, and so if inclusion's too hard for you, go. I don't know, that sounds awful, but I think it's about, you know, this is what we do and, and we want you to be a part of it if you feel like you can, you know, commit to this same approach. Do you have any more questions before we finish up for the night? No? Kind of like a TED talk. <laughs> Just a little bit longer. Aren't TED talks like 17 seconds? So oh yeah, maybe we can put it on the TED Talk. <laughs> Just kidding. Thank you guys. Please join me in thanking Mary Louise.